after that and uh, we're resuming uh, now we're starting the afternoon session and we're starting with professor Petra Popovsky great friend and collaborator over the years and um, he will talk to you about the massive access right yes okay thank you Petra. thank you thank you Konstantinos for inviting me always nice to be back in Athens uh, back in 26 years ago I spent two three weeks as a student here exchange student so I'll Always remember that. It was not in American colleges, it was NTUA, but nearby. <laughs> so I'm going to talk uh, about models and techniques for uh, massive access. And normally when we speak about massive access, we speak about uplink. But today I'm also going to speak about downlink as well. So both things. And um, uh, this is the outline. So I'm going to speak about massive uplink access. Uh, then I'm going to speak about a model with a common alarm message, uh, which is kind of interplay of massive access and ultra-reliable communication. Then um, some techniques for user identification. And finally, uh, massive downlink uh, acknowledgement, which is a new work which has, we have started basically this year. So let's, let's start with a massive uplink access. So this is a classical scenario for massive access where we have uh, Massive machine type communication, so one of the three generic services of uh, 5G. And the canonical problem there is that we have a large set of uh, nodes that are attached to certain base station or to certain network architecture. And at given time, only some of them are active. And because they are sporadically active, uh, the assumption is that we do not know who is active, so we have to figure out who is active. Right? So we have an unknown subset out of a large set of devices. And uh, if, you, if you want to solve this problem, uh, you, you can see that this problem is solved with a certain overhead because you have to figure out who is active, then schedule them, then they transmit, and so on. So this, is, this was all uh, part of the, let's say, Aloha random access protocols and so on. And for example, if you, uh, the num the, to describe the subset of active users, you need, uh, logarithm two n choose k bits, right? Because I can, if, if there are k active out of n, then to, to there are n choose k possible subset. So to describe a given subset, you need uh, this number of bits. However, nobody knows these bits because they are all distributed. It's only, only a supernatural being observing them can say, okay, these are active or not. So we have to figure out this through the process, but it's an indicator of how much overhead we need, we have to have to learn those. So <clears throat> a little bit intuitive approach would be to say our uncertainty is logarithm two n choose k bits. So we have to have an information exchange process where we are going to get at least this many bits after which we know who is active. Right. Better, yes. To remain active as a node, our technician has asked you to be close to the podium if you can. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, 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 to, be care to, be, to, to stay active. I remember that. Uh, so uh, MMTC, so this, this is largest, this overhead is largest when K is equal to N half. We have the largest number of possible subset. But um, uh, massive machine type communication, as in classical Aloha, works by assuming that uh, we have low intensity access and the number of active nodes is much less than the total number of nodes. So it's a small, tiny subset that we have to discover. Yeah. Fine. So what is a communication model for this? There are many COM models that we can use. Uh, one which has been popular uh, in the recent years, this is not actually the Aloha model, this is the signal processing model, where we say we have a antenna, uh, receiving antenna, U, uh, YK, we have a transmitted signal from N nodes, and we have potentially N nodes, XKN is a transmitted signal, HKN is the channel that we are not controlling unless we have RIS that can control it. AKN is the activity, which is zero if the user is not active, one if the user is active, and ZK is the noise in the, in, in the slot. Right? So in a classical Aloha, you remove ZK, you say HK is equal to one, and then you only look at the collisions, right? So you can play with this model to, to recover different theoretical models from the literature. Uh, but the important point here is what are the sources of uncertainty? So what we want to solve and uh, what are the sources of uncertainty that are preventing us to solve them, right? 
So it is, uh, we want to find out whether AK is one. We want to find who is active. And actually we want to find what that device wants to say. We want to find X. We do not really want to find H. It's just auxiliary thing, the channel estimation, so that we can do the other stuff. So that's, that's an intermediate goal. It's not a final goal. And uh, so we have basically four sources of uncertainty, but we are mostly interested in these two and specifically in XKN. So the, the way you can work with this model is you can say, okay, uh, for modeling purpose, we can make the activity to be part of the transmitted signal. So what you can say is that you say, I have a specific transmitted signal where my empty signal means I'm not active and my non-empty signals means, non-zero signals means I want to say something. Or you can make the activity part of the channel where you say now instead of having a Gaussian channel with a lot of multipath, you say I have Gauss Bernoulli channel where I active user activates the channel and or doesn't use. So this, this are, there are many ways in which you can approach the problem. And you know, this has been, uh, this is a basis, why well, I mention it, because this is uh, this uh, look at the communication model is the basis for different solutions. For example, a lot of people worked on sparse, uh, uh, sparse signal processing techniques because if you have many devices N and only some of them are active, then you do this joint estimation of sparse subset, AKN, HKN, and so on. So, uh, but if we look uh, into the random access back Abramson, it has two classical assumptions. The first assumption is that the packet is an atomic unit of information. It's indivisible, which atomic means in Greece, right? In Greek. So, uh, so what does that mean? This was very convenient from the protocol viewpoint of Aloha, where we say we are only looking at the packet. We don't care what is inside, whether there are symbols, there are preambles, and so on. Just the packet can be received or not received. And this was a useful abstraction. Uh, and uh, then another assumption made by Abramson is in, let's say, ingenious analysis. He says, let's assume that the population is infinite. Why does he assume that? Because if the population is infinite, then uh, every time a new packet comes from the population, it will come with probability one from a new device. So we cannot use learning and memory from before to coordinate. Every time we have to coordinate again. That's why he makes this assumption. Uh, so all, as it's called also, once in a lifetime activation of a user. The problem with this assumption is that a packet cannot have a finite, uh, uh, a packet cannot have a finite length simply because if we have n number of devices, n number of devices, and n goes to infinity, and we want to identify the devices, we have to have logarithm two n address field in the packet and that will go to infinity as well. So you see, we are hitting the limitation of the model where we say we have an atomic packet, but we have infinite number of users. Once you start to look into the structure of the packet, this is not possible. Once you look at the symbol level. So what do we do there? Also when the packets are small, like in this MMTC, then we have this finite blocklet effects, you know, the, the whole theory of finite block length developed in the, in the recent years. So, uh, several uh, information theoretic researchers noticed this problem and then they went on to fix the model. One is uh, what is called many access channel, where, which is described in this paper, where they say that uh, a similar model to the general one I described, but uh, <clears throat> they're saying that if the users are accessing, one of the M messages is sent, and then the number of possible users is tied to the length of the field where we are encoding the user address. So they are actually describing an access system, but they say we have to spend resources into identifying the users. And if we do that, we have to reserve certain number of sy symbols. And then they derived how the system behaves with respect to this uh, reserved number of symbols. Unsurprisingly, there is, there is a difficult math there, but unsurprisingly, this LN should scale is a logarithm two of the number of users, as we, we could guess from before. There's another uh, model developed around the same time of unsourced access, where uh, Yuri Polyansky is looking into this problem, saying that, let's assume that HK is equal to one, 
the K active users, the D non zero messages. And what he says is forget about the authentic, forget about the identification. All the users are picking random messages from the same set of messages. So keep in mind that if I have uh, M, uh, M possible messages encodable with logarithm two M bits, and if I all that I transmit is a message from there, and then Constantinos picks also from there, whenever you receive, you don't know whether it's from him or from me because there is no address. And they, they do this for mathematical symmetry to assume you know certain properties of the code and so on. But under that assumption, then people realize that this is not it's not possible to identify the users. And this is called unsourced access, uh, because you cannot see the source. Uh, decoding is done up to a permutation of transmitted messages. So you are getting the messages. You say, oh, these messages were transmitted by this set. I don't know who transmitted them. And if one message appears two times, I announce error. It's convenient to define like that. So if two users pick the same message, it's error. And this is an important assumption for what, assumption for what comes next. So this is defined, the error is defined from perspective of a user. As I said, an error occurs if the message is not decoded correctly or more than one user uh, sends the same message. And there are finite block length uh, effects into this uh, you know, transmission of the message. So basically, these are symbol level models, unlike Aloha that is a packet level model. So there have been a lot of interest. A lot of groups are working on this, on this unsort random access. Then they're trying to put it into a context of massive MIMO, then different spreading sequences, and so on. There's a lot of interesting work going in this direction. So just the theoretical result by Polyansky for unsourced access, how we could develop actual waveforms that should do that. And there's a lot of work on that. Uh, second assumption. So the first one was that the packet is an atomic unit of information. Second assumption is that the users are activated independently, meaning that each user is activated with certain probability. And the probability that multiple users will be activated is a product of the individual probabilities. But we know that in practice, this might not be the case. Because if we have certain sensors that are observing the same sensor field, they're going to be activated in a correlated way. So we do not have, this, that's kind of like a batch activation. So we are not activating users, we're activating subsets. And that assumption has not been worked a lot with. So uh, in my group, we have done a couple of work with that. But today, I'm going to talk about a specific work that combines both of them. Uh, you know, uh, in the there's this uh, MMTC, Massive Machine Type Communication Service, and then there is ultra-reliable low latency service in 5G. And sometimes we get too eager to do combinatorial research, and we say, what if we do massive ultra reliable? We already combine, you know, terahertz risk, massive ultra reliable AI, and so on. But I will not speak about all the combinatorial possibilities here. But what if we combine? If we ask for massive ultra reliable latency communication, that's a, I think that's an oxymoron by definition. The reason is that if you can do ultra reliable latency communication at a massive scale, then it should be a piece of cake to do it with two, three devices, and we, do, and we know that it's not a piece of cake, right? So there's something else there. So how, what is lying at the intersection of uh, these two? So this is possible to have massive and ultra reliable communication when the information is correlated. And uh, this is a scenario that we defined. Uh, now, actually, we are making a very rigorous information theoretic extension of this. But this, at least here, we defined and, and did some results for, the, for this setup. So there is a physical phenomenon like alarm, oil spill, whatever, and there are sensors around. So these sensors are measuring also some other stuff. They're measuring temperature, they're telling their battery uh, lifetime or whatever. But if they detect oil spill or alarm, they all report that message, right? So we have we made a model where a device can generate its own message, but it also can send the alarm message. So the way the way we have built the model is that Whenever alarm occurs, whoever detects it sends exactly the same message. But if the node doesn't detect the alarm or there is no alarm, then the node with some probability sends its own message, like what is a battery status and so on. Why is, why is this challenging the model of uh, unsourced access? First of all, th this is how the mo we made the model. 
It's actually very simple. With probability PA, there is an alarm. And if you detect the alarm, you send the alarm. If you don't detect the alarm, then with some probability, you send ordinary message. If there is no alarm, you send ordinary message with some probability. And why is this against this unsourced access? Because remember that in unsourced access, we claim that there is an error if two nodes are sending the same message. But actually, when there is an alarm, you want them to send the same message. So we have to redefine the error, right? Uh, so there are, in total, uh, N devices and K of them are active. The thing is that if you try to measure the spectral efficiency of this, actually, if the probability of alarm is high, and if the alarm is detected with high probability, the spectral efficiency of the system is low because everybody sends the same message. The amount of bit is equal to logarithm 2 MA. If there is no alarm, then the spectral uh, efficiency of the system increases because everybody sends its own message, right? So the question is, how do we judge the performance of this system? So you see, we want the alarm to be sent with ultra-reliable probability. And we want, if there's a lot of interference of this massive access, if there's no alarm message, that that to be sent efficiently, so with relatively high spectral efficiency. So we have a clash between high reliability for a single message and relatively low reliability but for, for many messages. Okay, so we arrived to a setup where we have a trade-off between massive and ultra-reliable. So uh, that's the setup. And that's the setup. <laughs> and then what are the error events? The error events are actually many different. Uh, not, not only that you cannot decode the message, but one that was dominating was false alarm. So that you imagine that there is an alarm in what you received, but nobody is actually sending it. And then there is a trade-off between uh, the error of the standard message and the error of alarm message. So uh, it, it's here you can really tune the design of your system to see what is important for you. If, if you say, look, the alarm is so critical that it's OK to have false alarms as long as we detect the right one, then your performance of massive access is going to suffer, of course, as in every decision system. Uh, so uh, this is, for example, for a block length of 30,000. We have uh, 1,000 devices. We fix the error probabilities. And this is the, the per device spectral efficiency. As this increases, the error probability of the alarm increases. How do we control the spectral efficiency? By the uh, detection power. The, the higher the by detection probability. The higher the probability that we are going to detect the alarm message, the lower the spectral efficiency. Because if we detect the alarm message, everybody does the same. Right? So this is, the, this is just a parameter in the system. So this is the most important graph. Uh, this red line is what Yuri Polyansky made in uh, his work with just ma massive access. So we say, what if we add alarm here? So if the alarm occurs with a very high probability, and then there are very few nodes sending the alarm, the spectral efficiency is very low, or the, the required AB over N naught is very high. Why? Because there are few devices that want to send the alarm, but they don't. They, they are not too many, so they have to send it with a, with a large power because we want high probability. And then this decreases as the number of uh, devices increases because there will be more devices to push the message through. And then it reaches a minimal point, and from here, the multi-user interference starts to kick in with the standard messages. So just to tell you that this is generalizing the unsourced access by just putting the requirements on the ultra reliability and, and low latency. So um, then I'll talk for the second thing, which is uh, very practical, I think. Uh, so I was ever since, since, since reading first time about this unsourced access, I have been bothered with the fact that you cannot identify the users. I mean, it's, it's not possible <laughs> To, to, to use a system where you cannot eventually identify the user. You have to, you have, to have a, a way how to do that. Uh, but mathematically, what we are saying is that the whole packet should be selected from a random subset. So we cannot, because if you select a fixed address, that will be a fixed field. So it will not be a random bit. But the whole theory is developed for everything being random. So how do you do that? So then the question I was thinking of was, we have your favorite, your, take your favorite URA, uh, unsourced random access implementation. You want to put user data and ID in the system. What you want to get at the output, you also want to get user data and ID. 
But this one is unsourced. How do we sneak data and identification to a system that doesn't recognize them and that wants to everything to be random? So here's the trick. You uh, mark messages. Normally, they have information bits, which should be perfectly random, right? And then uh, there is MAC, which here MAC means message authentication code. And the message authentication code um, is a code which is computed based on the integrity of the message, maybe some nonce, and the address of the user, the secret key of the user. Sorry. And then based on that, you can identify to whom this message belongs. The point is that normally in the, our MAC medium access protocol, we do not talk about MAC, which is message authentication. We just ignore it. But in this case, it, it comes out handy. And this is random. This should be also random cryptographically. Because if it's not, <laughs> it's not cryptographically strong, right? The message authentication code has to be random. OK, so how do we do that? Uh, in this time slot, as I said, k out of n, n users are active. So the base station sends a nonce. Nonce is uh, this one time path, one, one time uh, publicly sends a signal B. And then um, uh, everybody computes that with a secret key. The base station has the secret keys, of course, of the attached users. And then the main idea is that when the, the, the messages are recovered, are recovered, then the base station goes one by one and tries the keys to see which key can open which message. And then whenever a key opens a message, that message belongs to that user, right? So everything is random, but you can identify it, provided that you know you have the secret key. We actually patented this and, uh, with, uh, with an industry. Uh, then, not going to too many to, to the equations here, the point is uh, the, the base station produces this unordered sequence of K messages, or less, depends how many it decodes. And then an error occurs. Whenever there's a, there's a communication error, if the message is not decoded correctly, and there's a cryptographic error in the sense that if the message cannot be authenticated or if more than one user is authenticating the same message. So there's a collision in the cryptographic domain. And this is how the protocol looks like, which I, which I mentioned. And then um, we do this with uh, this function, which is computing, this, this is a hash function. And this hash, hash function, it's a universal hash, you know, universal type two hash that guarantees that two users that are different are going to collide with probability one over the total number of users. It's like choosing them randomly. And it's appended to the data, creating a complete message. There are two advantages of this. One, we are keeping the whole thing random, so we can use URA. Second is we are removing totally the address field so maybe actually we can gain something in efficiency because we are not sending the last part of the message. But that gain is, not, is significant, by the way. We evaluated it. Uh, so what we do is, uh, as I said, for every message we are computing with different keys, and we are getting an estimate of our identity of who has transmitted that message. So. How, how we, would we do this ideally? We have all the keys, we have all the message. So we try all the keys to all the message. This is very computationally complex. I mean, the interesting thing is that in normal, we don't think about this, but in normal communication, when you say, I send you my address, this is the source, this is the destination, there's no uncertainty. You just allocate them to a certain user. But here you hide them together with authentication. So there has to be some work like proof of work, as we say in blockchain, where, where you have to do a lot of work computational to find which user is matching, right? And um, there are, so there are errors uh, whenever there are multiple users that are matching or, there is, or we cannot find the user that is matching, or we can find a phantom user that is matching something that was the code that he never sent. And what we are trying to do now is, um, see how to design this MAC field to control the cryptographic collisions. And uh, besides, these are the cryptographic errors. Besides these errors, there are, of course, uh, no normal communication errors. Type one error is that a, the key of another user produces a match. Type two error is that the key of a user 
validates more than one message. That's another type of. of. And uh, then uh, we have another authentication of false positive. Uh, the unsourced decoder produces a message which is perfectly valid, can authenticate the user, and that user never sent that message. Actually, these things are happening even with CRC, but they are so rare so that we do not notice in the communication system. But when we have short packets, then the probability of this kind of spurious events is increasing. So uh, we did heuristic search because actually searching all the keys was very demanding. Uh, so the, authentic the authenticator tries all the keys until it finds a match and then stops, says this is the user. Of course, this is problematic because this is, cannot detect type 1 and type 2 errors. So we cannot find two users that authenticate that message, right? And uh, if we look into the, this is the just num simple numerical illustration. This is an illustration of how much uh, power is needed in DB with res when we do not consider this authentication. It's just certain probability of false positive uh, when we have 50 and 150 users. And we see that the, the curves are very sharp. The curves are very sharp means that the probability of error goes very quickly down as we, as we add power to the system. And then this is a similar performance when we want to have, uh, for example, here, when the false positive performance should be very low, then we need to use more power in the system just to avoid that we are seeing these phantom code words, right? And when we have 150 users, then we are starting to get, starting to get this dominating, uh, how it's called, inter-user interference effect. So if we calculate the total error probability for a system that we were looking at, so we, if we have 32 bits, then we are hitting here certain error floors. And these error floors are because of the user picking the same message. But we can see, for example, that the uh, uh, if we have only uh, information bits and MAC, it goes down, the probability of error. But if we have uh, information bits and MAC and address, then it's hitting the floor. So, so basically, we are removing some error floor if we, rem if we avoid to send certain information. I, I like this principle not only for this setup. We found a simple example. But imagine that if we start to create the communication systems in a way that the control information is implicit. So we can actually find out based on some context. That is all this semantics, meaning, goal, and so on. That's related to it. So remember now that we are limited by the control information. So every time I have to send something, I have to tell this is it. This is uh, the packet. Then you have to decode it and then decode the, the rest. But what if we have ways to send control information that is more efficient and not explicit before the packet, right? Finally, I'm coming to, I don't know how much more time I have. Oh, okay, well, I'll finish, okay. Okay, because I, I pushed a little bit higher speed, but uh, it seems that I'm on time. So what is, what is massive downlink acknowledgement? So as I said, our previous work and a lot of this massive access work talked a lot about uh, uplink. So how do we deal with interference in the uplink? How do we decode the signals and so on? But eventually, in any practical system, you have to send some acknowledgement. You have to tell to the users what was the result of their transmission. So we have uh, the first phase is a random access. That's what I discussed before. And the second phase is acknowledgement. So we are sending something back to the users to figure out what they have done. So there's, of course, a simple solution to this. A simple solution is that Whoever you decode it, I decode it, uh, I don't know, three users, uh, Constantinos, uh, Christos, and so on. And then I just put their names, Constantinos, Christos, Igor, and so on. And that is done. It's done. Is there a better way how to do that? So do we need to actually use a fixed amount of data, fixed amount of bits per user to, to do this? What are the limits of the trade-off on this? Can we reliably acknowledge the users if we use less bits? Why is this important? Well, imagine that you have some systems where you have a fixed packet length. You don't want to have a variable packet. You want to have a certain number of 
L bits sent in the downlink, and these bits should tell everybody who has decoded the message or not. And you know, this is tricky because you cannot fit all the uh, users within these L bits. So this is the problem we were considering. It's called uh, massive RQ protocols, common message acknowledgement. So we're having a set N of potentially active users, which is from zero to N to the minus one. Uh, for example, it's two to the 64. If each user has an ID made of 64 bits. Then the set of active users, as in random access, uh, as I mentioned before, is much less than the total number of users. Set of recovered users are the users that we are decoding after our favorite unsourced random access or sourced random access procedure, whatever. And then if, let's take that K is constant. We're going to go to the variable K first. So, so let's say that the number of users that transmits is constant, but we can revise this assumption afterwards. So what kind of encoder we want to have? We have B bits to send uh, feedback information. So we, we want to have a function that maps a certain subset, n choose k subsets. There are n choose k subsets, right? So we, we, can, we can take this and map it into B bits so that whenever the user receives this code word, can say, oh, I'm in a decoded set. So this is acknowledgement for me. So this is a generalization of uh, ARQ protocols where we have transmit acknowledgement. Transmit. This is kind of acknowledgement to everybody. So there are false positives again. So false positive is that uh, <clears throat> if the uh, if the user has transmitted, is not been in the recovered set, but receives acknowledgement. This is a fatal error, right? Because the user will think that the message passed through and actually didn't. There's false negatives, meaning that the user is uh, thinking that he or she was not decoded, but actually she or he was in the recovered set. And all these events depend only on the active users. They do not depend on a set of inactive users. The key observation here is a very trivial one that the inactive user didn't send anything and doesn't expect anything. That's So the key idea here, before I go to, is, is the following, that if uh, I can ensure, and let's say that we have two people here that are, uh, agree that they are never active at the same time. Of course, this is a strong assumption. Then, uh, Whenever one of you is active, if I say if I use the same acknowledgement for both of you, then you know for whom the acknowledgement is because you're not because the other is not active. So the key point is: Can I make acknowledgements that are make that are not precise, but this imprecision goes maybe towards inactive set, so nobody will misinterpret it wrongly. So how do we do error-free encoding first? So our free encoding uh, is, of course, if we, our, if we encode every user with a fixed number of bits, as I mentioned before. A bit better strategy is to take logarithm 2 and choose k bits and then encode all possible subsets. Right? There are all possible subsets of k users. So I'm saying this subset was decoded, and then you can check yourself, okay, am I in this subset? I'm in this subset, so it's fine. That's, that's another way how to do it. And if you compare the naive uh, fixed length encod deco uh, uh, encoding versus this with the uh, n choose k, of course, the number of bits per user decreases as k grows for the n choose k part. It doesn't change for the fixed length, right? because there's nothing there to, to optimize. Now, how do we do encoding with errors? So what we do is we enforce false positives. And this is a result used from database and hashing. So we, we just borrowed some ideas from there, but applied it to, to the massive access. So what we are saying is that if uh, this is the right set that you want to decode, you can send a message W, which is covering that set, but maybe also something else. So it's covering maybe some users that were not recovered. And with this, you are saving bits, 
but uh, with high probability that you control, people are going to get acknowledged for their message. So it's one of the cases where the surprise, I think that there's no big math in this. And actually there is big math in the guys that proposed it originally, we just managed to adopt it. But I think the surprising result for me here was that it's a situation where you on purpose send wrong information and that doesn't harm the system. It's never, in, in Shannon's model, we never say send a random message which is incorrect. But here, if you to consider the protocol aspect, actually, it, it, it works in that way. So what we have seen is that this false positive and false negatives, we can try to set them you know, to a certain value. So the higher the false positive and false negatives, the less bits we should use for the acknowledgement. So what we have seen is that false negative doesn't change so much, doesn't affect the... So we can actually set the false negative to zero. But false positive, the number of required bits very quickly goes down as you allow more false positive. So what we have done is we have allowed more false positives and arrived to this equation, which says that the number of messages that you need are inversely proportional to the probability of false positive. So the low probability of false positive requires more bits. How do we do this? In these, are, these are the bounds. How do we do this with practical encoding scheme? So one is a Bloom filter. I don't know whether you know Bloom filter. Bloom filter is uh, you indicate presence in a given array. I think it has been used for routing and so on. So there is a there is a there is a array, let's say, of zeros, and then you compute based on your address, you compute in which positions in these arrays you are going to put one, and that's your identification. Then another user uses the same array. It's like a multiple access channel that is interfering, but it's an or multiple access channel. So one of these cells will be one if either me or somebody else has activated it. So when I look, so for example, when a, here user two is activating these two cells, the, the yellow one, this one and this one. However, if there is a user five that is activating this cell, a user seven that is activated this cell, then you will think that the active user is also two and five and seven. So there's a false positive there. So this is the way, so Bloom filter is a way how to encode with false positives. And it has been very useful in routing, databases and so on. But it doesn't work well in this setup. And then we found a hashing procedure back from 2001 or two, where they show how you could do this optimally. So what you do is you define two types of hash functions. And then uh, uh, for the three users here, you have to find these three uh, values that you need to send so that the three hash functions are checking in. So you're solving equations with three unknowns. And then once you do that, you send this linear equation result, Z1, Z2, Z3, and every user checks whether his or her hash is, is solving this equation. If it solves, then the user is present in the hash. This is optimal. Unfortunately, not done by us. We have just adapted it to our <laughs> case. Uh, so as I said, it's a, it's a very old paper, basically, 2008. So here we are showing how we compare to the upper and lower bounds with the number of bits that you need to send. So uh, we are seeing that uh, how it's called, the linear equation hits very close to the lower bound. So it's almost optimal to do it in that way. Then what we have done is we said, okay, what happens if K is random? The number of users is not known. So you are kind of uh, encoding how many users are there and then showing their identity. But what we have assumed is that we have a, the total number of bits is fixed. So once you spend amount to encode uh, K, then the rest, is fixed, so you have to encode more users with a fixed uh, uh, length coding, right? So you don't change the packet, because every time you change the packet, you have to signal that as well, right? And then we have in investigated the, how this works with the variable k. Uh, so what we have assumed here is uh, uh, fixed length coding, Poisson arrivals from the users, activation, then Rayleigh fading, 2048 symbols, and 64 transmit antennas. I, 
the results are showing that the way we are, we are doing it is very reliable. But what I wanted to show you here is the ARQ model, is that we have uplink success. If there is uplink success and there is a feedback decoding success, then everything is done. If there is uplink success and feedback decoding fails, then retransmit. But there is one case where we have a fatal error, where if there is an uplink failure, but downlink falls positive, then the user will think that his packet was decoded and will stop transmitting it. So this is not, in, in the normal ARQ, you never have this case. How do we solve this? We solve it through higher layer procedure where we do reconciliation and check over a long time of whether, whether the structure of the packets is the same as with the transmitted node and what has been received. So um, this here is just to show the efficiency of this LE uh, linear equation that the reliability stays very high even if we have a large arrival process because it's a very robust coding with a very few bits. So that brings me to conclusion, actually made on time. Uh, I tried to convince you that there is a rich area of massive access modeling, which could be used in the context of all the talks we heard today, radar, power, uh, wireless power supply, or RIS, and so on. And then uh, if somebody tells you that massive machine can we make massive ultra reliable? Yes, probably we can, but we have to look into the content of the message. Then uh, I have also shown a method how to put identification into unsourced access without violating these uh, mathematical assumptions of the, of the random code words. And then finally, I talked about the problem of feedback. Uh, the newest thing there is that, this, that we started to talk about this problem, but of course, we borrowed some techniques from some other fields for, to solve it. So that would conclude my talk. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. Any questions from the audience? So, um, can I think of this as a way to improve this RTS-CTS protocol, for example, that Wi-Fi has, That's a good which point. is quite inefficient? Uh, this is RTS-CTS is solving the hidden terminal. On so, it's kind of reserving. Uh, this here is towards a single access point. Uh, to our central, so the, the access here is uh, resolving the collision when it occurs, because RTS CTS is to yes, avoid the but, collision. But uh, actually, okay, good point. Maybe, maybe I'm, I shouldn't be referring to RTS CTS explicitly, but the whole uh, 802 MAC, yes. okay, where if I recall well, when there is a collision, you just drop. Those packets no, are lost, sure. that, that, that's right? The whole, the whole area of massive access yeah. is to go inside the collision and do whatever you yeah. can with that. But that's why you have to change the model you have to change the <laughs> model to come from packet level to symbol level. Okay. But if there is such a potential here, maybe it's something you want to try. Yeah, definitely. Because that's a big problem. You know, Wi-Fi access points, the capacity drops exponentially as the number of people connected to a single access point Actually, the, goes the, up, right? The, the Wi-Fi, there is a, I mean, my obsession here is the control information because Obviously, it's a lot of that. In Wi-Fi packet, if you send just a single byte of Wi-Fi, and if you put all the packet overhead there, then your throughput is peanuts, nothing. Yeah. You have to actually send a large packet to get this to this 54 or 100 or whatever. Of course. Uh, and be percent. alone. Yeah. And the question is here, in general, towards when we go towards 6G, the question is, what could we do about the control information? Because there's a lot of it flying around. M most of it is not used. The, and this is, you know, one tiny step how to, I, I showed two, at least two things, how to decrease the control information without sacrificing certain performance. Okay, great. Uh, if there's no more questions, ah, Christo. Christo. Yes. We do, but let me give you a mic so that uh, they hear you remotely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so thanks, uh, Peter for this uh, interesting stuff. So my question is on, on the topic that you mentioned that you want to identify the, you want to find out the ID of the user who sends the data. Yes. Uh, there's many scenarios also where you want the data anonymous, right? Uh, anonymous communications is, is, is a rising thing as well. So I wonder whether there's, there's a, there could be a hybrid, uh, you know, where you have some users or some of the time you can so, some, somehow encrypt uh, the, the sender. Yes. Uh, or, 
Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you could straightforwardly adapt the scheme which I have put here because uh, here identifying of the user depends on the secret key. If you don't have the secret key, you cannot do that. So basically, you can give the secret key to those that w you want them to identify you. Otherwise, you can just leave the packet as it is. Because the, the, the condition to identify from whom the packet is coming is to have the secret key. Otherwise, if you don't identify, the problem is if you don't identify it, the packet comes and you say, who needs this packet? You know, to the higher layers and somebody has to pick it up. That means that if the user is not identified, that all the packets coming from that user have to be just sent to some sync. We don't know which sync would that be. Yeah, but there's definitely scenarios that uh, require that. Maybe, you know, uh, you know, some, uh, statistical studies or, uh, you know, health studies where you want to collect statistical data without knowing who it belongs to and personal information and, and all that. Yeah, that would be unsourced access. But the point is that when the data comes, it's totally unsourced. You want, you don't know whether, uh, if you get the blood data, uh, from me and from you, how do they know which packet to put where? There has to be a way, right, in, in, to include it into the into the system. And then you have to go to some schemes like multi-party computation, you know, where, where everything stays random, but there is at least some parties which have to do something with that data. Otherwise, otherwise keeping it completely random, uh, that, that's the problem with unsourced access. What do you do with that data? When it, when it arrives, uh, if it's a temperature data, for a certain region, then you don't care, of course. But if it's a data coming from individual about uh, some event at a motion sensor, you better know where that sensor is, right? And uh, but but the, the point for uh, anonymous, I think, could be controlled cryptographically again with these secret keys: what you allow at a given location and what you can conceal. I think this whole area of multi-party computation is is very exciting. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, about this MAC cryptography key, so we assume that you share the keys before communication. Yeah, exactly, and as we do in every when when you do, when you attach to the base station, you share this. Okay, so you have this phase of training, let's say. Of yeah, saving. we have we have this uh, in LT in five G. We always share the keys, right? So so before we start communicating, there is always a secret key, and the, the, the point is that here I assume that that has happened. So how do we use it afterwards? And also, what is happening if the number of users is dynamic and changed? So, uh, if the number of users is dynamically changed, then we have to update the cryptographic keys. Okay, so you have this. And problem. but but the number, the dynamic change of the user is already uh, uh, makes a lot of headache for the unsourced random access, you know, for the analysis and so on. But practically, I think you can address it by uh, yeah changing the, the the cryptographic keys. Okay. I see. Any other questions? But I thought we thank again.